Sweden's Gripen fighter does not look like a machine that should trouble the world's most powerful military establishment. It is smaller than American fifth generation jets, lacks stealth shaping comparable to the F-35, and does not carry the political weight of a U.S. defense program backed by unmatched budgets. Yet behind closed doors, among planners and analysts rather than public spokespeople, the Gripen represents something deeply unsettling to the Pentagon. Not because it is stronger, but because it challenges assumptions that have underpinned Western air power for decades. The concern is not about raw performance alone, but about what the Gripen proves is possible outside the American way of war. To understand this unease, it is essential to understand how the Gripen was conceived. Sweden did not design its fighter to dominate distant battlefields or project power across oceans. It was built for survival against a technologically superior adversary operating just across its borders. During the Cold War, Sweden assumed that if war came, its air bases would be destroyed within hours. The Gripen's entire philosophy emerged from that assumption. It was designed to operate from short stretches of road, disperse rapidly, refuel and rearm in minutes, and return to the fight before an enemy could react. This is not a glamorous vision of air power, but it is a brutally realistic one. That design philosophy alone challenges a core Pentagon assumption, that air superiority is achieved primarily through exquisite platforms operating from secure, large air bases. The Gripen was built for a world where those bases do not survive. It assumes persistent missile threats, constant surveillance, and degraded infrastructure. In doing so, it exposes a vulnerability in how many advanced air forces plan to fight. The Pentagon's concern is not that Gripen outperforms U.S. fighters in direct combat, but that it offers a different, and in some contexts more resilient, model of air warfare. Another unsettling aspect is cost. Modern American fighters are extraordinarily expensive to buy, operate, and maintain. Their capabilities are immense, but so is the logistical footprint required to sustain them. Gripen was designed from the beginning to be cheap to operate by comparison. It requires fewer ground crew, less specialized equipment, and significantly lower operating costs per flight hour. This matters because air power is not just about what a jet can do once, but how often it can do it. A fighter that flies twice as many sorties for the same cost can, in certain scenarios, generate more combat power over time. This directly challenges the Pentagon's preference for high-end, low-density fleets. The U.S. model emphasizes technological dominance and assumes that quality can compensate for quantity. Gripen suggests an alternative, a balanced approach where sufficient capability, combined with high availability and rapid turnaround, may be more sustainable in prolonged conflict. This is especially relevant in a war of attrition, where maintenance bottlenecks and spare parts shortages can cripple even the most advanced aircraft. Then there is the question of sovereignty and control. Gripen is designed to give its operator full control over software, weapons integration, and upgrades. This is a critical distinction. Many advanced fighters operate within tightly controlled ecosystems where updates, permissions, and integration decisions are centrally managed. From Washington's perspective, this ensures interoperability and security. From the perspective of smaller states, it can look like dependency. Gripen demonstrates that it is possible to feel the modern network fighter without surrendering full autonomy over its use. This autonomy is strategically disruptive. It means operators can integrate weapons from multiple sources, adapt tactics independently, and modify systems without waiting for external approval. For the Pentagon, which has long shaped allied air power through standardization and centralized control. This is uncomfortable. It reduces leverage. A world where allies can operate advanced systems independently is a world where U.S. influence over operational choices is less absolute. Gripen's electronic warfare capabilities deepen this concern. While it is not a stealth aircraft, it is designed to fight in contested electromagnetic environments. Its systems emphasize jamming, deception, and situational awareness rather than invisibility. In practical terms, this means Gripen does not rely solely on avoiding detection, but on complicating the enemy's ability to track, target, and engage. 
This approach aligns closely with lessons emerging from modern conflicts, where electronic warfare has proven decisive in disrupting precision strikes and degrading advanced sensors. The Pentagon has invested heavily in stealth as the cornerstone of air dominance. Gripe and success suggests that stealth is not the only path to survivability. Electronic warfare, networking, and tactical flexibility can achieve similar effects under certain conditions. This does not invalidate stealth, but it does undermine the notion that it is the singular solution. That realization is strategically unsettling, particularly given the cost and complexity of maintaining stealth fleets. Another factor is basing and logistics. Gripen's ability to operate from austere locations dramatically complicates enemy targeting. In a conflict involving long-range precision strikes, fixed bases become liabilities. Gripen's road-based doctrine disperses risk and increases survivability. For planners accustomed to operating from massive, well-defended airfields, this represents a fundamentally different approach. It raises uncomfortable questions about how resilient current force structures truly are under sustained missile attack. Interoperability also plays a role, but not in the way it is usually discussed. Gripen integrates seamlessly with NATO systems, yet it does so without being dependent on a single supplier or doctrine. This means it can operate alongside American aircraft without being subordinate to them. In coalition warfare, that distinction matters. It allows smaller air forces to contribute meaningfully without being locked into predefined roles. From the Pentagon's perspective, this dilutes hierarchical command structures that have traditionally placed U.S. forces at the center. There is also a geopolitical dimension. Gripen represents a competitive alternative in the global fighter market. It offers advanced capability without the political strings that often accompany U.S. platforms. For Washington, arms exports are not just economic transactions. They are tools of influence. When countries choose Gripen, they are not merely selecting an aircraft. They are signaling a desire for greater strategic autonomy. That trend, if it spreads, could gradually weaken the U.S. position as the default supplier of Western air power. The concern becomes sharper when viewed through the lens of future warfare. Conflicts are increasingly likely to involve degraded networks, contested logistics, and sustained pressure rather than short, decisive campaigns. In such environments, resilience matters more than perfection. Gripen's design prioritizes getting back into the fight quickly, even if conditions are less than ideal. This pragmatic approach contrasts with systems that require pristine infrastructure and extensive support to function at peak performance. Importantly, none of this means the Pentagon believes Gripen is superior to American fighters in a direct confrontation. It is not. In terms of stealth, sensor fusion, and deep strike capability, U.S. platforms remain unmatched. The concern is conceptual rather than tactical. Gripen challenges the idea that air dominance must be achieved through ever-increasing complexity and cost. It suggests that adaptability, autonomy, and sustainability may be equally important. This conceptual challenge arrives at a sensitive moment. The United States is grappling with rising costs, maintenance backlogs, and questions about readiness. At the same time, Adversaries are investing in strategies designed to exploit logistical and infrastructural vulnerabilities. Gripen's philosophy aligns uncomfortably well with those realities. It is a reminder that the most elegant solution is not always the most resilient one. From Sweden's perspective, Gripen is simply a rational response to its strategic environment. It reflects a small nation's need to deter larger powers without bankrupting itself or surrendering control. That this approach unsettles the Pentagon is less an indictment of Gripen and more a reflection of how dominant paradigms resist alternatives. Military institutions, like all large organizations, are shaped by their assumptions. Gripen forces those assumptions into the open. The real question then is not whether Gripen threatens U.S. air power, but whether it exposes blind spots. It suggests that future air warfare may reward forces that are flexible, dispersed, and politically independent. It hints that dominance may come not just from superior technology, but from the ability to sustain operations when conditions deteriorate. 
for a military built around global reach and technological supremacy. That is an uncomfortable but necessary conversation. Gripen does not threaten American air dominance today. What it threatens is complacency. And in the realm of military strategy, that may be the most dangerous thing of all. If you value deep documentary style analysis that examines not just weapons, but the strategic ideas behind them, support the channel by liking the video, sharing it with others interested in military affairs, and subscribing for future long-form explorations of modern warfare and geopolitics.